So I would like to welcome you all. It's great to have you here. I know there are quite a few of you who have been here before, so welcome back. And also new people, welcome to you too. It's, it's great to have you here as well. We've got a great session. And so for this audience with the presidents, my first duty is to hand over to the president of the Spiritist National Union, Minister David Bruton, who will introduce his panel of guests. So over to you, David. Good evening, everybody, and welcome. Uh, it's great to be here for the last in our run, this series of Audience with the President. Um, just out of interest, the background I have behind me tonight is the New Look uh, Pioneer Centre at Stansted Hall. The window in the back wall was placed there uh, thanks to a donation of a gentleman who wanted to do something for Stansted to remember his wife who passed to spirit a little while ago. And those of you that have been into the Pioneer Centre at Stansted Hall, I'm sure will agree the whole dynamic and energy of the room has been enhanced by this beautiful window out onto the woods at the back of the hall. So uh, that's where we are tonight uh, for our final audience with the president. Um, about 10 years ago, when I first uh, became president of the Spiritualist National Union, I drove down to Southampton to do a meeting with uh, members of the Southern District and various representatives of churches. And a lady who I came to know quite well and came to be a good friend actually buttonholed me after the meeting and said, what's happened to the science in spiritualism? And she was quite right. Um, it seemed as if we'd lost our way a little bit uh, from a scientific aspect. And over the last 10 years, I and others have been working to enhance the scientific research that's going on the, the work that the union is doing with many universities around the country and actually around the world as well. So for tonight's session, um, we decided that we would talk about the science, science and spiritualism. And I'm joined by two very special guests um, who I really am pleased have joined us here this evening. I'm going to begin um, by introducing Chris Connolly who is um, a master's in science, he's got a master's degree in science and is also a diploma holder of the Spiritualist National Union. Chris first walked into Gravesend Spiritualist Church back in 1997. And he, he was actually attending to support a friend and her family who had been through a recent double bereavement. But from that moment, Chris was literally hooked and he <laughs> his work and journey into spiritualism. He soon began to in, unfold his own individual mediumship and stepped onto the rostrum at Maidenhead Spiritualist Church as part of a fledgling evening. After that, he then spent four years serving the circuit with various more experienced mediums, which he considers to be his personal apprenticeship. I actually asked Chris um, in preparation for tonight what his proudest moments had been within spiritualism. And he relayed his great sense of achievement he has when approached by a, an individual or family after a service wanting to thank him for the communication they'd received. He's also very proud because he was part of the team that has established the laboratory facility at the Arthur Finlay College which has been going some years now. And uh, there's a lot of interesting stuff happening there. So uh, good, good on you, Chris, for being part of that journey. So I also asked Chris, why is the scientific aspect of the movement so important? Religion, said Chris, from some can appear exclusive. Christianity is for Christians. Islam is for the Muslims. Judaism is for Jews and spiritualism is for the spiritualists. But spiritualism is different in that its philosophy is based not upon rules, but on observable natural law. And as such as a religion, it lends itself to the pursuit of inquiry, knowledge and progress, rather than blindly following a doctrine. It is precisely because of its uniqueness that I feel we have an obligation as spiritualists to acknowledge and respect teachings given 
from spirit and our early pioneers, but also be willing to challenge this convention, always seeking to better understand and explain our experience and relationship with ourself, others, and of course God. It is through this pursuit that I hope that those things we refer to as the phenomena of spiritualism will no longer be exclusive to spiritualists, but be of benefit to the whole of humankind. I believe science provides us with the mechanism for achieving this. Now, because Chris has obviously got lots of spare time, um, he's also uh, shared with us that he's uh, embarking very shortly on a PhD, um, which I understand will also be focused on mediumship and spiritualism. So um, he's certainly a busy man. And can I welcome you, Chris, and thank you for joining the panel tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you David. The next lady, or the other, the lady that <laughs> part of that lady, oh dear, bang, um, who's part of our panel tonight, um, is actually a former teacher of mathematics and physics. Trish Robinson is a long-term council member, past vice president, and immediate past president of the Scottish Society for Physical Research. Psychical, Psychical research. <laughs> She's a tutor uh, for the Department of Adult and Continuing Education at the University of Glasgow. And in conjunction with Professor, Professor Archie Roy, she provided a session program of 22 hour lectures per session for the university in a series entitled An In-Depth Study of Psychical Research, Trish. Got it right. Well, well done. <laughs> this course has now been running for six years. The paranormal, and what is the evidence? She's, she was also a founder member of a project uh, which also involved Archie Roy called PRISM, uh, which ran some years ago and in which she worked with many Spiritualist National Union mediums. And I understand a lot of the work was also done at Stansted Hall. In addition to 29 years of experience in investigating spontaneous cases, Trisha has appeared on various radio and TV programs and be, has been invited over the years to speak for many varied organizations throughout the UK. She's also written the foreword to Dr. Mark Ireland's highly successful book, Soul Shift, an endorsement of Bill Kasperi's book, The, Ga the, Ga the Ga Galilean Pendulum. <laughs> Sorry, and some of her comments are on the back cover of Trevor Hamilton's book, uh, Tell My Mother I'm Not Dead. She also, in her own right, has been the author for two books um, about her life and about her works in this particular field. She has a wealth of experience, she's a wonderful speaker, and it's a great pleasure to welcome Tricia uh, as part of our panel tonight. Thank you for joining us, Tricia. Hi. So, ladies and gentlemen, we are going to begin and I'm going to ask um, a few introductory questions as per normal and then we'll start the discussion and open the floor up uh, for you to make your points and ask your questions. I think it's fair to reflect that both Chris and Tricia, who have got a great interest in this particular subject, uh, have a great deal of experience. I'm sure they'll share with us. So can I begin by Tricia and can I ask you, Trish, um, is mainstream academia more receptive today to spiritualist phenomena? What, what are your feelings about that? Uh, quite simply, no. <laughs> <That's fine. laughs> no, yeah. no nothing changes, uh, unfortunately. People keep thinking they're going to reinvent the wheel and, and they're forgetting about the hundred years or so of psychical research where eminent people have investigated all of these things. And unfortunately, I can see it in Facebook, I can see it all over and in, and in universities. No, they really are not. They're very much died in the wool, whichever discipline they happen to be in at that time. Okay. Chris, have you got any thoughts and feelings on that? I, would, I mean, I would concur a bit, but I do think there is subtly some changes happening. I think, um, like you mentioned before, we've set up this research lab. 
Um, I mean, and Trish is correct, you know, we, the, uh, academia can be quite slow to change. And this is why I feel the change should actually come from spiritualists going out to academia rather than acad waiting yeah. for academia to come yeah. to spiritualists. Yeah. And, um, and I think if we did that, then obviously we can be the, the, the seed or the catalyst of change uh, instead. So, and I think we are slightly seeing that. I mean, we've got, a good, we've got good connections now with uh, Northampton University. You know, and uh, that's good work done with that. We've got uh, King's College London. I believe there's some research going with now as well that are coming to us and asking us for advice. So there is there is change happening, um, but I think what's happened is as well that the change has, has moved or shifted away from trying to prove survival. You know, in the past, the research has been about are mediums mad? You now, are mediums gullible and things like that? and our medium just making this stuff up. Whereas now, the, the, as Trisha says, there's, there's, there's over 150, 170 years worth of research out there that quite conclusively shows that something really interesting is happening. So now what you see is a shift in the scientific community in terms of looking at not um, are we making this up or is survival a reality, but instead saying, well, what is this experience that people are having that these mediums are having how can we explain that experience and that's exactly as we talk about the doctor i'm doing i'm hopefully will be doing is i'll be looking precisely at that i'll be looking at how we perceive the spirit world and what that can actually tell us about um, us as human beings the way our brain evolves and so forth i think it's interesting to note um and I've, I, the response we had from Tricia, I've heard that from many other academics, so it didn't surprise me. Um, but certainly the work we're doing with King's College London and also the work we're doing with Yale University in the States. Um, the King's College um, project that started some months ago is a cross-disciplinary um, project drawing on very many different departments within the university. And um, I, I think that is perhaps a step forward for us. Um, they, say they seem to be welcoming and interested and want to listen to us in designing the research project to get the very best that they can. And also yeah, Yale University, are, they're doing a, a, a tremendous uh, project at the moment, the SCOPE project, which being an American university is very, very well funded. Um, so again, a lot of quite kind of high powered people coming from different departments. So maybe we are just beginning to turn the tables a little bit yeah. and taking it out of the, purely the parapsychological side. Yeah. Well, well that, say, that sorry, was like, just sorry. That's what I'm going to say very quickly. What you said there, um, uh, David, about obviously coming, they're coming to us for advice. You know, this is something that I've been in fact, banging on about for a while. I wrote a letter that was published in the Journal of Psychical Research back, I think it was in 2016. And again, I was fortunate enough to present some work I've been doing at the SBR conference in 2019. And in both cases, I was sort of like pleading with them saying to the academic community and the researchers, stop treating us like lab rats. You know, stop putting us in a little maze and expecting us to find our way out and actually start coming to us and ask us, does, what does this research actually, what value does this research actually give? You know, how can we work together in a collaborative sense and actually come up with an idea, come up with an experimental design that actually um, has some value, not just to spiritualists, not just to researchers, but to, to humankind as, as, as a whole. Sorry, Trisha, I interrupted you. I'm very interested in the fact, David, that different departments that you say are interested in what you're doing. Now, it, we know, I thought you were talking about science in general, but uh, psychology units, parapsychology units are certainly, hmm. as Chris said, they are learning. They are learning to do exactly, and it may be at Chris's impetus, they are learning to look at the experience and then study it. And that's what science does. A, a psychical research or spiritualism is an observable science in, in a way. You, you, you can't say two and two always makes four, but you can look at all the phenomena, kind of categorize them in a way, but not entirely, see what's happening, and then try and get why is this happening. Now, it was a very interesting thing, uh, Chris, 
and, and David and Chloe, who's on the panel tonight as well. Chloe had a, a science weekend in Edinburgh at the Arthur Conan Doyle Centre. And I was very, very pleased to hear, you know, Chris Rowe, Cal, David Saunders, all the ones who work in Stansted with you. Now, people might not know that Stansted have a laboratory downstairs where the people from the university can come and work. Now, these are parapsychologists, which stem from psychology. And they have always been interested, but sometimes quite dismissive, as Chris said, but the new ones, are learning because people like myself and Chris, we tell them, you know, we're not mad. And you have to look at the quality of the people that are telling you these things. And that is very, very encouraging. And I did a thing, I, I can't actually remember if it, was, if it was in Stansted or at Air University, but it was years and years, I'm talking 25 years ago, where with PRISM, PRISM is psychical research involved with selected mediums. We did meet at Stansted Hall and we did a toss it around between psychical researchers and spiritualist, um, well, authorities really, what we might do, which way we might go, what we might test, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And we, we did have a few experiments from that. Now from that, I managed to purloin a mind monitor, which is a very primitive EEG machine, et cetera. Now, I, I am not a medical person at all, but I jumped in with two feet and I took charge of the mind monitor and I ran a, a whole day's experiment with mediums who, who pretend to go into trance. And the mind monitor, it was a, you put the strap round here and it had a few electrodes and you had a screen and you had a, a hard copy of what was coming out with their brain waves. And there was absolutely no doubt at all that when people try to go into trance, their brain waves move from the beta, which we are doing just now, a beta to alpha one, alpha two, alpha three, and then down, if you're lucky, you get an odd theta wave, which means your brain is in a different state. Now, what we showed with that was, it wasn't the same as relaxing or meditating, because I also took, I had Mary Armour to help me with the nursing part, and she took, she took the pulses, we had a machine for the heartbeat, we did all the physical things as well. And when mediums went into trance, when their brain waves went down, the body function didn't change. Whereas if you were relaxing, then your pulse would go down, et cetera, et cetera. So it showed that going into trance is different from simply meditating and relaxing. Now, as I said to David Saunders, whenever it was, Chloe, you, you're now using fantastic machinery. They've got machinery that they can put little bits on your head and it goes straight to computer and they can analyze that later. So they, they get so much more information than I did. But what I suggested, which they hadn't done, Chris, was that they also take their body um, functions as well for at least some of the, mm. you know, some of the experimentation to see what they found, see if they could correlate what I had done 25 years ago with much more sophisticated equipment. Because as you say, we're past, and do you, know, do you know what was very encouraging? One of the girls there was a speaker and she was a clinical psychologist. Uh, not a psychologist in you know in the academic sense in a way and she was very very interested in well basically in what I had to say and in my my first book with all the stuff that was in it so I gave her my first book and uh, she was absolutely delighted and she came back to me to say that she was going to not use it as a textbook but when she was training other clinicians she was going to tell them what, you know, more or less what was in the book and to look at the person that's having the experience because they're the most important people. Now, we all know you can get people that are not fully mentally charged properly, but you can usually tell them straight away. There's, there's ways of knowing and it's just really through experience. But I'm talking about in the good cases that we certainly, they can certainly go forward with that. They're taking it forward and Professor Chris Rowe and his team are actually doing a great job. But you're saying now, David, that some other departments are interested. Would that be, uh, what, would that be, um, I don't know, archaeology? What departments are interested in working with you? I don't have the list to hand, but they were, they were outside the narrow field of just yes. one department. Yes. They've got professors and academics from different departments that were yeah. all collaborating together to produce this project. 
and that's that was exciting. So I think I think things are moving. That's that's brilliant. Absolutely. Well, it'll be very interested to hear what happens with that. It'll be very interesting. I think it's been hit by COVID because they just started interviewing, and of course everything went into lockdown. So uh, <laughs> it, everything's been put on hold. Chris, can I ask you? Um, yes, boss. Uh, we've we've talked a little bit about um, this this approach um, from academia. Um, Given the fact that we now, as the union, I think are involved with about six different universities uh, throughout the UK and abroad, um, what do you think the scientific approach can bring to the exploration of spiritualism? Gosh, well, I'll tell you what, someone, I mean, I, I did a, a talk for the East London District Council um, uh, a couple of weeks ago. And, uh, and uh, a question that was asked there was, you know, if, if we as spiritualists know uh, within ourselves that there's a God and there's a viable and the connection with the spirit world and the phenomena of mediumship and so forth is a reality, why are we bothering with science at all? And uh, from my perspective, again, my response is that very similar to what you said, you read out, uh, uh, question when you ask the question about uh, why the scientific community is why science is so important it's because i feel that very strongly that spiritualism is not something just for spiritualists you know if you look for example um we used to be believed that mediums uh their personality was defunct uh there were cognitively cognitive deficits you know in terms of their cognition um, they had no intellect, they were gullible, and all these sort of things. And also, there was common, common perception that as spiritualists or mediums, that we were suffering with uh, a, a mental health disorder of some kind, some sort of pathology. But we now know, um, and this is just para paraphrasing some of the research that Northampton University have done, is that, uh, that mediums enjoy a better level of mental health than the non-mediums. So, you know, it, it, it's flipped our understanding of what mediumship is about and what, what the benefits of mediumship are. So if you think to yourself, well, if that affects mediums in that respect, what can that, what can further study do in terms of it helping us explore the fields of consciousness, of mental health, of pathology, of schizophrenia and all these sorts of conditions? What could um, understanding mediumship offer that community? If you're taking into a case of uh, spiritual healing, obviously now we're getting we're slowly getting more and more of our spiritual healers with it working within hospitals and so forth. But wouldn't it be nice if, for example, it was something that was mainstream in uh, the, the the healthcare setting? That now instead of having to go to the doctor and the first thing they do is prescribe you a, 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 a pharmaceutical or a tablet of some description medical science or the, the research that's been carried uh, carried out into spiritual healing has now come to such a degree that actually you actually get a description of spiritual healing do you know what i mean uh, instead physical mediumship it, the laws of physics i mean the laws of physics is are, are supposed to be quite restricted quite contained and yet you can sit in a seance and watch things levitate all around the room you know without things being touched, allegedly. Um, and you think, well, what could that inform? How could that inform the laws, uh, the world of physics and the laws of physics and laws of chemistry and so forth? So for me, what I, what I enjoy about spiritualism more than anything and why I feel science is so important is the fact that it has so much to offer those outside of spiritualism as well as spiritualists as well. Thanks, Chris, for that. Tricia, I'm going to ask you a personal question now, and you have every Ooh. right to tell me no. Uh, <laughs> when did you first have good evidence of uh, life beyond this life? Personal. Well, that's a kind of long story. Everybody asks me that. 
what I can I just make quite clear that psychical research has actually got nothing to do with spiritualism at all. But the early psychical researchers, they were they, the Psychical Research Society in London was set up to to look into the claims of spiritualism, you know, materialization. So it started off in a positive way. They started to look at the claims of spiritualism that developed into psychical research with a whole lot of other different things apart from survival of consciousness. Now, the one that I'm interested in is survival of consciousness. And I started with no religious belief whatsoever, not that you need one for spiritualism, actually. But um, I started off with uh, being a maths and physics teacher, very pragmatic, uh, didn't really believe anything. But as an intellectual interest, uh, and I don't know why yet to this day, I went along to the church at Somerset Place just to see what was happening. I wasn't unhappy. I didn't have any uh, illness. I, no one had died. I was very happy, actually. I was married, husband, two children, two cars, two jobs, no problem. But I decided to look into spiritualism, and that's when it all went down the tubes, as it always does. <laughs> you probably know that. And that's what happens to us all. And uh, so I was intrigued, intellectually intrigued, by what I was hearing. And then I started, I'm going back now, long before Archie Roy's day, I'm going back to 1983. And I started to listen to what people were saying and uh, I found it interesting in that. Then I got to the stage of accosting people in the hall, asking them if, that, if what they got was any good. And then, then of course, uh, Archie and I were, by them, were flung together. And Archie himself always said, we didn't design working together. Somebody had that in mind because we, not saying we fought, but we had differing opinions and we worked well together. And Archie used to say, when we worked together, two and two make much more than four. And it did because we're completely different people. Anyway, uh, and uh, just to go back on the research side, Chris will know this, but the, the viewers might not. Archie and I wrote three papers on mediumship, which were published in the Journal of the the Society in London, the Society for Psychical Research, in which we tested the hypothesis that all medium statements are so general they can apply to anyone. Now, I'm not going to bore you with that because you would be absolutely bored, but after five years' work and three published papers peer-reviewed, which is quite difficult, we, we nullified the hypothesis to, uh, to a million to one that it certainly wasn't chance. That now, The trouble is the good mediums we're getting the correct information for the sitters. But you all know as well as I do that every medium is not particularly a good medium. And therein lies another problem, unfortunately. But we, it's, it's in a scientific journal, it's, it's been published, and we, we have nullified the hypothesis. And do you know to this day, that was 2004, the last one was published, and no one has seriously challenged our findings. Richard Wiseman tried to, but I soon put him in his place, as some of you may know. I'm not going to discuss the whole thing. I phoned him up. Anyway, but no one has seriously challenged that. And the likes of Chris Rowe, the professors in Northampton, they actually always cite it. So this is where science, psychical research comes in to help the claims of, you want to call it spirit, spiritualism. Spiritualism, as you said, the, the survival for everyone is, is for everyone after death. No one has a right to survival. Everyone has it. And believe it or not, although I'm not a medium, people still phone me up with their troubles with cases. And I two in one day last week, which hopefully I'm working on. Quite often it only needs common sense. And if I need a medium, I'll get a medium that I actually trust. So th this, is where, this is where science and spiritualism come together. It is very important, I think, for spiritualism. You want to say for credibility that um, I think it's been shown time and time again that science has been a great advocate of survival and what you do, because spiritualism is the only religion that says outright that they can communicate with people who have passed over. Now, go back to my question. I'm rambling again. I do that. But when was I convinced? Okay, I started to look at that and then looked at different aspects. Archie and I started the university lectures. Uh, and when you're actually researching things, you learn a lot yourself when you're doing that. But if I'm really and truly honest, I only actually became totally convinced about survival with one, one of my own cases. 
And it was a case, I think it's in my first book, Things You Can Do When You're Dead, whereby a woman came to me, I didn't know her, and she told me her daughter had been murdered. And uh, she said the police were getting nowhere. Could I help? Well, I knew she wanted a, a sitting with a medium. It was only six months, and I thought, no, it's too early. So I said to her, can you bring me an envelope and uh, I'll take it to a few mediums and we'll do psychometry on it to see if they can get anything for you. Nothing promised, of course, you never can. So I met her again at a certain time and she brought me this a, this brown envelope, A5 size, with lumpy things in the middle. You, you wouldn't know what it was. It wasn't a watch, it wasn't a ring. And I took it to a couple of mediums and they they made a couple of pronouncements about it. Uh, but nothing very much. Then I took it to another medium that I really trusted and I was able to go into their house. And I threw the, I threw the envelope on the, on the desk and I said, can you tell me what you can get from that? And the medium wasn't very pleased and said, do I have to? And I said, yeah, you do have to. Okay, the minute, the second the medium put the hand on the envelope, looked at me and said, I've got, I've got a girl here that was murdered. And I just went, mm hmm. Now remember, I don't know anything about the murder. I don't know anything about the girl. And he described the medium, and I've got shivers down my back when I'm talking to you. He said, she's got a uh, longish brown hair, uh, quite young, and she's telling me she was murdered. And then through the medium gave through, the, the, the person gave through the medium, gave me 29 pieces of specific information about her, including information that happened after she had died like today my mother has moved my photograph from the mantelpiece to the top of the television that day that i was speaking uh, to the medium and she said that happened with the mother she said uh, my my boyfriend was a, no uh, my boyfriend was the first one to know that i was dead he phoned my mum and she, she gave a whole lot of information but she misses her, her three cats she lived one up on the right hand side in a cul-de-sac. And th the cruncher for me was when the medium said to the girl, it was like a freebie, she's telling me that she was in Contonville prison when she was young. And I thought, bloody hell, you can't, that's, <laughs> I don't know when it's been in jail. I thought that's either right or it's wrong. And I get 29 pieces of specific information uh, from, from the girl. Now, I don't know if it's right. The medium doesn't know if it's right. So I dutifully had noted, got it all taken down. Thank you very much. We had a cup of tea and that was it. So I made an, I made an arrangement to meet the mother shortly after that, a couple of days later. And this time I went to the mother's house, which I'd never been to before. So I found the house, walked in, and the first thing I saw was a photograph of a, a girl on top of the television. And I said, oh, is this your daughter? She said, yes, I just moved the photograph there two days ago, and it was the day that I had been speaking to the medium when she said, my mother has moved my photograph from the mantelpiece to the top of the television. Now, you can't make that up, and I and it was right, she had been in jail when she was younger. Now, there was a lot of other specific information, and it was just incredible, and every piece of information that was given, I just read out to the mother, I said, I'm going to read you out some things, you tell me if this is right or wrong it's either correct or it's not correct there's no in between it's kind of right no it's right or it's wrong and i only read out two, 22 pieces of information because nine seven of the other were very personal like she, she had 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 an abortion when she was young and i thought well maybe the mother she was 26 a girl maybe the mother didn't know that she doesn't need to know that now when her daughter's been murdered so i chickened out i did the psychical research thing maybe wrongly i didn't tell the mother everything about the method of her murder or a, a having had an abortion but 22 pieces i did read out were 100 percent correct that convinced me when it happens to you then you know so that i mean I, I i was still working with on on that, the other things but that was the one piece i have to say totally convinced me brilliant absolutely brilliant i know i think now time is ticking on and uh, you know we could we could i'm sure we could Forever. talk all night let's open up the floor and see if any of our uh, guests want to ask any questions elf 
Okay, so if you can uh, think through what questions you'd like to ask, you can put them in the chat box or put your hand up as Chloe and Kim have. So we'll go to them in a moment. But before we start, a very quick one uh, from Sophie and Mike as well, just for Chris. They were just inquiring, Chris, uh, which university you're going to be doing your PhD at? Hopefully, do my PhD. Hopefully. Yes. Hopefully. Yes, it's a uh, university in Ken Kensbury Christchurch. Brilliant. But there, there are many universities out there that uh, are open to uh, uh, exploring this as a topic now. So, you know, Northampton, you know, King's College London, there's all sorts of universities all around, all around the place now. Brilliant. Magic. Thank, thank you very much, Chris. Um, I'm going to go straight over to Chloe now. Uh, I'm asking you to unmute your microphone and come into the room. Hiya. Thank you very much. Hi, Chloe. Um, hi, and hi to Trisha um, and to Chris. Um, Trisha, thank you very much because thanks to Trisha, I have learned what I have learned and I now run the Psychic Investigation Unit at the Arthur Conan Doyle Centre and Trisha taught me methodology, how to go about investigating. So as somebody who's got a foot in both camps, I'm a passionate advocate for psychical research, but I'm also a practicing spiritualist. This question is for both of you. In my research at the moment, I'm really fascinated by spiritual healing. And I've looked both at the tradition within spiritualism, which is incredible but the evidence is largely anecdotal um, obviously academia has investigated spiritual healing way back in the day we had dr bernard grad at mcgill back in the 60s we did studies which we really did rec um, suggest that spiritual healing especially contact healing as a thing continued with the likes of william bingston with his cancer studies do both of you, I know that Trisha has done a study on spiritual healing within mm -hmm. spiritualism, but do you know if there's more work being done within spiritual healing, within sp the context of spiritual healing within spiritualism in particular, or is it more generalized hands-on healing that's being studied? Do you want to go first, Trisha? Well, I can't answer that because I don't work within the spiritualist realm. I would we'll go over to Chris and uh, David. Okay. Um, from my from my perspective, I'm not aware personally of any uh, spiritual healing uh, research, but I think there may be something coming. I think David might be able to to say that because I've heard something uh, about there's something um, coming on. Chris Rowe was involved a couple of years ago in uh, doing a meta analysis of all of the various studies that had gone into yes. healing, which was presented to the UK Parliament. Um, and that was quite interesting. I, I understand a professor at Exeter University is also very interested. Um, he's an ex-general practitioner and uh, he's, he's also doing work. And a lot of um, the studies that we seem to be approached about at the moment are based on healing and the study of healing. So um, there's definitely interest out there in the academic community uh, to embark on healing studies. The question, the question that comes back though is, are there methods or their hypotheses, uh, does, does their hypotheses marry what uh, spiritualism is, is about or what spiritual healing is about? Because if you read a lot of the research, and I'm aware of the one that you're talking about, David, Chris Rowe, um, if you read about a lot of the, the research out there, what academia seems to try to do is they get a group of people together with a, with a specific uh, 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 disease or condition and then what they do is they have a set of healers and they say well, heal that condition. The, tr the trouble is that when you do that very often you see the results have very mixed bag some positive not some good not some not so good however if you take away the condition and actually say to someone look go for spiritual healing and get the person to look at their general well-being so it, in current, so it includes not just their the condition specific condition that they're looking for healing but also maybe their mental well-being their emotional well-being and there are there are ways of measuring that as well there are surveys and self-assessment instruments that used to do that you find conclusively all the research seems to suggest that spiritual healing does something good does something beneficial it's really just making sure that the scientific community asks the right questions. 
yes. and encouraging them to do that. Can I also mention, uh, we've just uh, done a submission to support um, a project that's been organized by the Open University. Uh, they're see seeking uh, funding from the Research Council and the union has actually supported that by providing a reference. And that again, that's actually going into spiritualist churches and looking at the practice of spiritualist healing. We've worked with a group before some years ago uh, on a study based in Stoke-on-Trent and all of the various spiritualist churches around that area and um, they've they've been trying ever since to get back to work with us and to explore another aspect of spiritualism so um, I'm just fingers crossed that this grant gets gets made by the research council and again that's something that we can have an input into looking at me the methodology that they're going to use to conduct the research so again something very positive chloe have we answered your question yeah. <laughs> yes thank you very much <laughs> thank you chloe thanks for that question that's great i'm going to go over to kim now and ask him to switch your microphone on and ask her question Oh, hi. I don't know who wants to take this one, possibly David and possibly uh, Chris, but there is a science room at the Arthur Findlay College and uh, I know that it's not open there at the moment, but when it is up and running again, who gets access to the room and can that be brought more into function with some of the courses if the students are willing? Um, this is a, a challenge that we've had. Um, the the whole intent of creating the room and we work very closely with chris rowe and the spr to actually who partially funded the facility there um, was to have it as a facility that was literally open to anybody that was interested in doing research we have done one or two tentative forays into trying to bring students from the college into the laboratory facility and I think that's something that Chris is trying, Chris Rowe, is trying to refine because um, you know Kim as a tutor at the college that um, the weeks are so full on and busy. Yeah. Um, taking students out of a week is sometimes a challenge. And the last research that was done down there, we actually didn't use the students at the college. We brought students, well, we brought people uh, to help with the research from the outside um, but uh, there is the investment has been made and I know that Chris has got plans for it and I can tell you from the college's point of view and the union's point of view we are fully committed to getting the best we can out of that experience and I know that uh, Chris did some a presentation to the SPR I think last year and from that there was interest from other organizations in coming in and actually using the facilities and we're totally up for that right. they've been doing they've been doing uh, presentations on the college uh, uh northampton university we're doing presentations on the college i think at uh, the sbr annual conferences for the last three years yeah and uh, i know david's dr saunders now david saunders dr saunders has uh, did a similar sort of presentation at the parapsychological association um, conference last year so it is advertised it is out there and we are getting the word out there for it to be used absolutely okay. thanks Kim okay thank you Kim uh, I'm going to go over to Neil now and ask Neil to unmute your mic and ask your question hi thank you um, hello everybody as this is a topic of science I thought it was interesting pertinent only a few weeks ago, I actually ordered this book. I don't know if you can see that clearly there. Um, what's it called? Gary Schwartz, The Sacred Promise. He's a scientist in America. This was published in 2011. I can see a few people nodding there, so they obviously know this book. Um, but for those that don't, are interested in the science of uh, paranormal research, this is a, a bona fide scientist that's been looking into um, spirit communication and, and has done lots of experiments in his lab, including with angels and spirit guides. Um, and it's looking very promising actually. So I've been using this as a research for my own book because I want to try and put a bit of a scientific slant on my own book that I'm writing. So I thought I'd, I'd buy this book and I'll probably uh, carry on following this guy, Gary Schwartz. So if anyone's interested, I just thought I'd mention that 
for tonight's uh, recording. Okay. Okay. Thanks for that, Neil. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Neil. I uh, would we'll just go to the chat box now for a moment. Uh, and a question from a panel from Alan, um, who, who asks, uh, why don't the scientists in the spirit world kind of make it a little bit easier for us um, and uh, do their part really to, to help us? <laughs> Quite an interesting question. Any, any thoughts on that panel? Come on, Tricia, what are you thinking? What about Archie? Yeah. I mean, Archie, I can't believe, I don't know he's passed a spirit a couple of years ago, I think. Um, I can't believe that he's lost his interest. And then... <laughs> well, uh, uh, as far as experiments go, no, I've obviously had Archie back, but the scientists do try and make themselves, some are more interested than others. Nikola Tesla is still trying to make his way through to various people. Tesla was way, way, way before his time. And going back to your healing, not exactly a scientist, but you've got the likes of uh, Chapman Lang, Mr. Lang, who was the eye surgeon in Moorfields Hospital. He worked for years and years through George Chapman. You know as well as I do, everybody that's here, that when you communicate, now, no, well, I don't know the, the, the mechanisms of mediumship. We don't really know, but it would appear that certain people gravitate to other people and some people you couldn't work with, just the same as is on the earth. Then scientists have to get the right mix. They have to get the right people who are listening and do what, what they want them to do. I wouldn't say, uh, I don't think it's easy for them, but everyone who communicates, some are better at it than others, but some the ones and healing again harry edwards i believe is still doing the rounds trying to help people with the healing um tesla certainly for one i'm trying to think who else in the scientific world um i keep getting messages saying the likes of monty keen and archie you know are, are behind me but that's that's not proof and they come from people that don't know me but um it, it's difficult nobody's nobody said this was easy and uh, the answer is i don't know i think they try their best but they have to find the right person to know what they're saying thanks rich and, uh, any, any input yeah what i would say is the um, neil's book you know with uh, professor gary Swift, you know, he's actually working at the moment in a, a research organization that uh, is actually looking to develop technology i think they're calling it the soul phone uh, you can google that to find out about that but apparently they're actually there uh, their inspiration or their guidance is f through mediums or through the spirit world, scientists from the spirit world who are advising them on this technology. And, um, and apparently they're getting good, they're getting good um, results from this. And uh, apparently some sort of technology that is able to communicate directly from the spirit world to, to us. Very much like Tesla was uh, yeah. uh, ambition of achieving. Yeah. Uh, if yeah. memory serves me correctly, I think Tesla is has been quoted as one of the scientists who, who have allegedly, let's be scientific, allegedly uh, is coming through and uh, advising Gary Swartz and his team on the, the technology required. Well, so, yeah. Tes Te Tesla also came through uh, to uh, Professor Arthur Ellison at the school group. That was the, right. the group of scientists that sat in the school group, not the people that were invited just to go for general population. And Tesla actually <clears throat> drew, well, he was, he, uh, he was given, Arthur Ellison was given a drawing as to how to make some piece of electrical equipment that would make the communication better. Uh, and it, Arthur, Arthur made it and it did work to a certain extent, but, but not properly. Uh, Neil, are you, you're interested in EVP, aren't you? Nope, no answer. <laughs> yeah, sorry, I was muted. Yes, yeah, interest in EVP, we're interested in everything of it, really, but uh, EVP in particular, um, I like these uh, ghost Neil, boxes. Neil, for that, perhaps maybe there's one or two people out there who don't know what EVP is. Electronic voice phenomenon, for those that don't know, it's um, where people can come through, in the old days, it was real to real tape recorders uh, quite often, um, also through these days, more computers, digital audio recorders. Some cases, I believe in the Skull Experiment, they were talking about people coming through on their TV screens, uh, things like that. So yeah, anything the electronic, the spirit will try and, uh, it seems to impress upon their 
their communications in some way and also telephones as well we've had uh, instances where spirit have communicated via telephone as well yeah yeah well, we, we live in an age of communication, don't we? And I, I can't believe that the spirit world wouldn't take the challenge of using that uh, our devices to actually communicate with us. Uh, but we don't want to make too many mediums redundant. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> I don't think that would go down well in spiritualist uh, circles. <laughs> Al, do we have any other questions as we're coming up to time? We do. Uh, we've got one more question I think we can fit in. Uh, it's quite a juicy one. <laughs> um, and it, it's, it's from uh, Jane and Doug and they're talking uh, about um, statistics really and, uh, and how in research it is possible for statistics uh, on the surface of it to show that there is some significant uh, response there. Um, but they suggest that if the sample size isn't large enough, then, then that actually means uh, nothing. And so they ask, uh, do they know if any of the previous studies have been designed to ensure that the results are truly uh, significant? Any thoughts on that? Yes, well, it, uh, the, it's, it, the science of the, the science, the fallacy of small numbers comes into what you're saying. And all the studies I've got in, in the books, there's literally hundreds of studies of, of especially for healing and the, the, the sample numbers are always they have to be in the, in the hundreds high hundreds before they're meaningful uh, they're quite correct small numbers are meaningless and that is if I dare say a flaw in uh, some of the work that Gary Schwartz did god forbid uh, he used very small numbers in a lot of his um, experiment, experimentation and that's why some people don't look at it particularly favorably, I'm sorry to say. I can say that the Yale uh, project uh, that we've been involved with, they were looking at a sample si size of a thousand people and yeah. they had funding to be able to back that. Yeah, yeah. So uh, clearly that was significant, so yeah. yeah. Chris? Um, no, I mean, I concur with what's been said. The, the problem is with low numbers. Um, trying to get something of a significant power size. Um, so yeah, I mean, we do have the problem, but we have a, another problem, is replication. Uh, that's the other problem we have in, it is. Uh, so, uh, in all sciences, really, is replication. I mean, no, um, uh, Julie Schwartz, no, Julie Basial, sorry, Julie Basial, uh, the Winbridge Institute did a uh, did a study in two thousand eight. Again, unfortunately, with a with low number, I think it was about 25 mediums, was written up, but they did it as a randomized controlled trial, uh, uh, triple blinded study. Um, but again, you know, even though that's impressive, you still have to find replication. You still have to have people out there, researchers out there willing to replicate uh, your study. And, and the problem is because parapsychology, even though it's or, or, or this field of spiritualism, is still not always uh, considered a, a worthwhile pursuit i suppose in academia um, trying to get replication is almost impossible um, but again this is one of the reasons why we had this lab set up at the college because we were talking about uh, selection of mediums you know as trisha was saying you know, she had very good mediums in the prism experience yes that's the problem you know, and uh, julie bayshaw in mean, her research with um her mediums and she she screened the mediums that she wanted they went through a trial of of, of, of producing evidence and so forth and uh, and of course what we were finding in a lot of the research is that mediums were just going on to social oh sorry researchers were going on to social media to recruit participants for their mediumship studies and of course you know there's no legal statute as to who can be classed as a medium and who can't. So they were getting all, all sorts of abilities coming forward to their, um, to their research. So this is why it was so important to have the, the research lab. And of course, in the research lab, you can have 100, 100 students in one week at the, at the college. And so there is potential, if you know, you know with full use, full optimal use of the, the lab facility and the cooperation of the tutors at the college, to actually start getting big numbers in our studies. Mm. Which you will need. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Hey, David. Yes, Tricia. Can I just finish with a, a funny story about EVP? Go on then. Go for it. 
Morris Gross, the psychical researcher, who was very fastidious, but Morris was, he believed in nothing really to begin with. He was desperate to believe, but he didn't. And one of the times he was given, called to a haunted building, it was a, an older building. And Morris, he was an inventor, he invented a lot of stuff. And he took along the magnetic tape decoder, which seems to work better. He took along a magnetic tape decoder, you know, the old fashioned one with the buttons. And he, he left it empty on the floor of his empty house. He was the only one that had the key. And he set, he set the thing going and he said, is there anybody there? And he let the tape run all night. And when he came in in the morning, he rewound the tape, played it, and he heard his own voice saying, is there anybody there? And a voice said, no. <laughs> <laughs> and that was the end of his research project. That was it, that was it. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, um, once again, the clock has beaten us. Um, I want to give my personal thanks to Tricia and to Chris. I think we've had a brilliant evening. We could spend a week talking about this. Oh, absolutely. Spiritualists do love to talk. But I hope um, for many of the people that perhaps have never looked at the scientific side of our religion, um, mm -hmm. you, you've, you've we had your appetite well and truly wet this evening. And um, there's some excellent books out there that will inform your journey of learning a lot more about a fascinating subject and some of the work that's been done and you know i think it's true to say that spiritualism as a religion is now more accepted in mainstream society and i suppose getting it accepted in mainstream academia and science is the next challenge that we have to cross but my big thanks to chris and to trish for being wonderful guests tonight and producing a really interesting evening. And I'd very much like to add my thanks to every one of you that have supported us through our run over the last 12 weeks or so. Um, we were looking, uh, we're looking possibly at bringing the audience for the president back later in the year as a one-off occasional special. And we will of course promote this as and when it happens. Uh, for many of us, uh, the next few weeks are going to be crucial as we face the prospect of reopening our churches and starting to meet for physical worship again. Our intent with the audience with the president was always to maintain the spiritualist community and it's been a true pleasure uh, to welcome many of the guests that have contributed to this interesting journey that we've all shared and I'd like to say thanks to them all. I'd also like to say a big thanks to Alv, my newly created executive producer, as I call it, <laughs> uh, for his ideas and being a sounding board for some of my wacky ideas. Um, and of course, for his technical support, that has mean we've avoided being Zoom bombed throughout our own our whole run. So well done to you, <laughs> Alv, uh, for that. Um, I'd like to thank you all for joining us stay safe and let's all work together to proudly hold high the torch of truth for our beloved religion god bless to everybody and good evening thanks Al. thank you david an absolutely fascinating discussion this evening and a, a great end to this series and we one of the questions we didn't get round to uh, which came privately in the chat box to me is what is going to ultimately be the benefit of all this science and research to spiritualism. I think just hearing the rich seam of uh, things that have been spoken about this evening just answers that question really well. Thank you to our panel, thank you David, uh, just for helping to shape this discussion this evening and to our audience who every week has just helped to guide us through each discussion helping us to find out new things and just to inspire us. Thank you all for being with us in this series throughout. We've had so many sessions, all been great, all been different, and we look forward to bringing it back later in the year. So keep a watch out for that on our social media channels and our website. We'll let you know, and I'm sure science will be one of the things that we revisit after such a, an amazing discussion today. Thank you, everybody, and take care and God bless. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.